My name is Denominator, and Happy New Year! Hey Vector, what day is it? Today is Sunday, February 6th, 2022. Happy February! Hey, sorry I disappeared for about a whole month. I kind of had to hibernate for a bit there, but Long story short is, I'm back! So, I know you are all probably as ready as I am to move on from 2021, but before we do that, and of course move forward to the Chibi Robo retrospective, I wanted to talk to you guys about some of the games that I played last year. Why? Well, uh, since I haven't talked about it enough already, last year was a pretty different year for me in terms of gaming. And not only did I finally crack open my Steam account and start playing some of the games I'd owned, uh, mostly from free giveaways and such, I also finally got two different consoles last year, both a Wii U and a Switch. Now, let me tell you, being the owner of these two consoles within a year of each other was definitely an experience in and of itself, a something I definitely want to talk about in the future. But for now, I just wanted to focus on a few of the favorite games I played from across all of these platforms. Keep in mind that this isn't really a top 10 list or anything like that, and it's not a set of full reviews. This is going to be more of my thoughts, impressions, and a little blurb on each game that I played. Nor is this going to be every single game I played, but more just a happy little list of my favorites. With that said, let's start with a cute little duology of games that I played this year on my Switch. Hey sound effects guy, you're on this, right? I got it! When judging the value of a game, there's a lot to consider. The controls, the graphics, and of course the general flow of gameplay. Well, considering that Torre 3D and Torre 2 are both a single dollar on the Switch eShop, and have potential hours of replay value in their tightly designed stages, I think it's safe to say that these two games have earned their value. What started out as a tiny indie game that got picked up by Nintendo Life as the one dollar game better than Balan Wonderworld, has quickly become a bit of a cult classic amongst us lovers of independent developers. Simple platforming pleasures are prosperous in this cute little game about a cute little bird. D just look at it, it's so cute! These two games opt for quality over quantity in their handful of stages, with a heavy focus of going for your best time in each stage, a la Sonic Adventure. And given the insane times that speedrunners have already been setting for said levels, it's pretty obvious that the mechanics here are rock solid. I want to give a big old hat tip to developer Siactro for these great little games, and I cannot wait to see what they cook up next. I don't think I've ever played a game quite like Stonefly, and I do mean that in the best way possible. I can't remember how exactly I found the trailer for this game, but I can tell you I was hooked on the concept from day one. Stonefly just has a way of sucking you into its universe and characters from the synopsis alone. You're a tiny girl in a big world, and your only way of getting around is by piloting these bug mechs. Said mechs are used to travel the world and mine resources, and occasionally used to track down your dad's mech because it's kinda your fault that it was stolen by a mysterious stranger. One of the reasons I love indie games is because they often don't confine to the expectations of a well-known developer or franchise. And this game is breaking conventions all over the place. Instead of jumping, you spend most of your time gliding, using the B button for hops to increase your airtime. Instead of fighting giant insects, you stun them, and use a gust of air to push them away from your precious resources. It definitely takes a bit to adjust to such an unconventional playstyle, but when it finally clicks, 
It really holds together, and the soundtrack is absolutely incredible, combining with the cell shaded art style to create an experience unlike any other. I mean, this is the kind of music I wish Breath of the Wild had. Ironically, it just so happens to be one of the buggier experiences in this collection. Sorry for the terrible joke. But it is still well worth the price of admission to give this game a chance. Definitely going to be giving this one a dedicated review someday. I never got into the first ukulele game, and part of me is glad I kinda couldn't at the time. Newcomer studio Playtonic definitely didn't leave the best first impressions with this title, which has seen mixed reviews across the board even to this day. So when the studio announced that their direct sequel title was going to be a 2D platformer akin to that of Donkey Kong Country of all things, I'll admit I was pretty skeptical, but boy am I glad I decided to go for it. Ukulele and the Impossible Lair is great, and I could not be happier it turned out to be this fun. It does take quite a few pages <laughs> out of DKC's book, but I don't have a problem with an inspired game so long as it manages to stand on its own. These stages have a ton of variety, and the world map that holds them together has some really unique exploration elements that I really enjoy. That and the general movement is just fun. I'm going to assume that a more direct sequel like a Tukulele is in the works, considering that this game's title suspiciously avoided such a name, and I can say that my faith has certainly been restored in this studio. Here's looking forward to the Chameleon and Bat's next adventures. Told you I was playing some weird ones. Wally -E is my favorite movie of all time. If you didn't learn that after this video, well, hopefully you get it now. Wally -E is just one of the many Disney properties that received a slew of video game tie-ins, but compared to most of the ones I've played in the past, this one is way better than most of them. Yes, including the official video game for Wreck-It Ralph, and no, I will never let that go. Definitely not a flawless experience, but I can easily recommend it if you're looking for a good time. Wally's -E official PC game is available on Steam of all things, and it opts for a pretty unique playstyle. When you're not building up speed and jumping ramps Tony Hawk style, you'll be throwing cubes and using your laser to clear a path and find collectibles. I still think I prefer the Wii version a little more overall, uh, chalk that up to my personal experiences as a kid, but I'm definitely glad that I finally gave this game a try. What can I even say about a short hike? I mean, it's exactly what it says it is. A deceptively simple game with a delightful cast of characters, and some of the most satisfying gliding mechanics in any game I've ever played. A short hike strikes a nice balance between the charm and item collecting of an Animal Crossing game, and the climbing and platforming of a 3D Mario slash Zelda. And I have to salute the developers on the gliding again because it just feels... So good. It's not lying with that title, you can easily finish the story of this game in less than two hours, but I'd argue that if you want to get the most out of a short hike, you really don't want to rush it. Take your time, explore your surroundings, get lost in the woods, make some friends, enjoy the journey, because that's what really makes this short hike truly worth it. Nothing like being eight years late to the party, huh? 3D World was a surprise in pretty much every sense of the word when it launched back in 2013, and it's still kind of an anomaly today. And yes, I can hear you screaming at me through the screen, why didn't you buy the Switch version? And to that I say, I bought the Wii U before the Switch and I'm trying to justify my purchase, shut up. All jokes aside, I have played both versions of the game and I think I prefer the Wii U release. Don't get me wrong, I like that the Switch version has the improvements that it does, but it's also pretty obvious that the levels were not designed around the Switch version's increased character speed. And I gotta be honest, I really like the gamepad's integration in this. Being able to bonk enemies and interact with levels using the touchscreen is surprisingly helpful, especially in stages like Mystery House Marathon, a stage that I will never be playing again. I know I'm also missing out on Bowser's Fury, but for $15, I still think I got the better deal. Regardless of which version you play, it's safe to say that 3D World is far better than it has any right to be. A game that first presented itself as an HD sequel to 3D Land released to a surprising amount of critical acclaim. After all these years, I can finally see why. 
3D World has some of the greatest theming and stage design of any Mario game, and I'm so happy I completed the entire thing. Except for finishing every stage as every character, because no, I'm sorry, I'm not doing that. Oh wow, and I thought I was late to playing 3D World. A Portal is a series I've had on my mind for a long time now. I mean, people have been telling me how good the games are for years. I didn't really see the appeal, I rarely play first-person games, and even less so games with dark undertones like this. But since I've been playing games a little more on my laptop recently, I finally decided to give them a try. And yeah, okay, I get it now. Portal 1 and 2 are amazing. I like both of them for different reasons, but 2 is definitely my favorite for the hilarious writing alone. Not to mention the game is just a little more intriguing in general and has you exploring some truly insane areas like the Aperture Science of yesteryear. Also, flipping upside down is a little less vertigo-inducing in the sequel, so it automatically has my vote. However, it's still worth noting that Portal 1 beats the first game in the Creep Me Atmosphere department. Like I said, both titles are pretty amazing for different reasons. Either way, they're equally fascinating games that use the portaling mechanic to a truly dizzying degree, and considering that they ran perfectly on my toaster of a laptop, trust me when I say you owe yourself to try these games. Gabe Johnson, we're done here. Yeah, you already knew this was coming. Super Mario Odyssey is the Switch seller for me. It brought in a new era of Mario where it truly felt like anything was possible. Right before we got a port of the laziest HD Mario game to the same system. But whatever, I don't really have that much original stuff to say about this game. Story's great, Mario's movement is perfection, moon collecting is incredibly satisfying, until it's not, and yes, there are about 300 too many moons in the entire game. However, with all of that said, the positives greatly outweigh the negatives here. There's so many enemies, so many species, so many worlds. In a decade that was practically defined by the new Super Mario Bros. series, this game broke convention on basically all fronts and revived my faith in Nintendo's direction for the franchise. I can only hope that future games follow this kind of trend so Mario never becomes stale again. Thank you, Nintendo, for this wildly wonderful road trip of a game. I've been singing the praises of indie games for a pretty good few years now. There's nothing like finding a niche title that nobody's ever heard of and being able to tell the world about it. Well, looks like I'm doing that for Gris because... Oh man, th this isn't a game. This is an interactive Picasso painting and I am in love. I don't think it has ever occurred to me just how unique games can look until now. Not only is Gris a well-made Metroidvania, it's also absolutely stunning with hand-drawn animation that brings some of the greatest visuals I've ever seen to the Switch. Combine that with a story told completely through said visuals that focuses on the five stages of grief, and you have a title that impresses on basically all fronts. Please, play this game. You ever play a game that just goes straight off the rails? I've heard about Piku Niku a few times from a few people, but I don't think I was truly prepared for what I was getting myself into when I picked it up for myself. Physics-based platformer? Check. Goofy cast of characters? Check. Overthrowing an evil corporation looking to reshape the entire world? Sure. Why not? This game uses a deceptively simple art style to tell a story that's equal parts wacky and downright hilarious. Every time you think you've figured it out, it does something completely unexpected. This game is a gem, and I will not stop talking about it until I've convinced at least one person to try it for themselves. Funny how I've been talking about visual storytelling so much lately. I guess it's been on my mind a lot, and it's times like these that I really appreciate a story I can figure out for myself. Which brings me to Far Lone Sales.
everything about this game, the music, the sounds, the atmosphere, just make it something to behold. I've played a lot of games over the years, but none of them have come close to making me feel the emotions that this one does. There's just something about the way that it lets you experience everything on your own, accompanied by your only friend, a machine. The Okomotive is to your character what the Companion Cube is to Portal. The more time you spend fueling and running it, the more special it becomes to you. It's just you and this vehicle, out in the great unknown with only each other for company. As you brave the wilderness through thick and thin, you'll learn more about the world simply by traveling it, and what happened to it. I cannot express just how impactful this game was for me, and I hope it can be for you too. I have to confess something. I was once terrified of Animal Crossing. I know, it sounds ridiculous in a vacuum, but there's just something about these time sync type of games that don't gel with me. I like being able to play games on my own time, not when the games want me to play them. And as you can probably guess, this was indeed my first crossing. Probably not the best place to start, but what can I say? I was really interested in this one. For the most part, I can say that that interest has paid off. Yes, Animal Crossing New Horizons is a very time-consuming game, and I gotta be honest, for the first two weeks, I kinda hated it. The game asks a lot of repetitive tedium of you in the first few weeks, and in that time I got really bored of some of this game's more… recurring flaws. The progression is often locked behind very large amounts of materials. I still think the idea of a crafting system with no unbreakable weapons or tools is ridiculous, and I am absolutely sick of all these menus. But, as others have said before me, it eventually does get better. Of course, it takes about three weeks to get there, but building an island that truly feels like your own is indeed rewarding. I still think the game has some really weird limits that prevent it from being the best it could be, but New Horizons lays some credible groundwork that will hopefully inspire even more creativity in future games. And there you have it, from one of the shortest games I've ever played to one of the most tedious, but you know what, I'm really happy with this collection. Not only did I really expand my horizons, sorry, I, I just had to say it again, I also expanded my horizons in consoles in general, so I'd say that I had a pretty good year. Now, before we move on to the Chibi Robo retrospective, I want to continue thanking you guys for your support of this series. I know that it's kind of my bread and butter and the one thing that I've really been advertising, but I want to keep doing little things like this because it lets me get more creative and put more stuff out for you guys. Not only that, but I want to keep experimenting with the stuff that I like to play since before now, I was kind of primarily playing on my 3DS. So. Hey, here's to whatever the future holds, right? Until then, this is Denominator signing off. See you later, Ominators. Until next video. Bye!